to Matthew chapter 11. The message that God has put in my spirit to share with you and those that are watching is entitled, Window Shopping for a Savior. I mean, ladies, you like to go window shopping. The good thing about window shopping is there's no commitment. Staff don't come out there and ask you, what would you like to buy? You're on the outside looking in. There's no personal experience with the merchandise. We cannot take that mindset of window shopping into Christianity. Matthew 11, verse 2. And when John the Baptist had heard, you know, he's there in prison. But when John had heard in prison about the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said to him, Now mind you, he's the forerunner of Christ. When, G, when Mary heard that she was pregnant and walked in to the house of Elizabeth, her cousin, who was pregnant with John, and she greeted Elizabeth, John leapt in his womb and was filled with the Holy Spirit at the sound of Mary's greeting. They have worked together. They have been together as, as kinfolk. And now he's in prison for standing up for the truth. And he says to him, John does, Are you the coming one or do we look for another? Jesus answered and said to him, Go and tell John the things which you hear and see. The blind see and the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who is not offended because of me. The spirit of offense can shut you down when you even know Jesus personally to the point you start questioning, are you the one? Or do we look for another? We go window shopping for another one. That don't work. Turn with me to John chapter 3. Verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees. Pharisees were literally lawyers. They interpreted the law of God. And there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus how? By night. Isn't that interesting? He came to Jesus at night under the cloak of darkness and secrecy and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from where? From God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. And Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. I love Jesus. He just goes straight to the jugular. He doesn't mince words. He doesn't mess around. He just says it like it is. You better be ready to hear it when he says it. And Nic Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born again when he is old? Now, look at the way his rationale is thinking. Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And all the mother said, no. <laughs> Woo, burp things. Jesus answered, most surely I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where the wind is coming from or where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel? That word also means doctrine. So he's high up in academics. And do you not know these things? Wow. The teacher doesn't know about born again or how the operation of the Holy Spirit functions in believers. 
We live in an era today where vast knowledge is literally at our fingertips. You can purchase almost anything imaginable on your smartphone or your computer. Can I get a witness? With the creation of the Internet, many things exist now that didn't exist before. Before you make a purchase on the Internet, however, you can go to various sites and find ratings and reviews that allow you to make an informed decision about your purchase before being totally committed to it and doing it in the dark. How many likes to look at ratings and reviews on products? can save you a lot of hassle. Knowing that other people have bought what you are about to purchase and they didn't have issues with it gives you greater peace about your decision to buy that product, does it not? In these verses, we read about a leader who was a master, a teacher, like I said, a doctor in the teachings of the law of God to the Jews. Now, let's step back for a moment and assess this exchange that transpired between Jesus, God incarnate, and the teacher of the law. This leader is speaking to the Lord of heaven about being born again, and he did not recognize Jesus as God's son, nor did he understand what Jesus meant when he told Nicodemus that he must be born again, and he's a leader in Judaism. Unlike Nicodemus, who had the privilege and opportunity to speak to and learn from Jesus personally, unbelievers or sinners like we call them in the church today do not have the, that privilege. Now, even though Nicodemus spoke to Jesus in person, face to face, there in the dark, he still struggled to comprehend what it meant to be born again, or as we call it in the South, get saved. Jesus made a point that was worth mentioning in the scriptures, that Nicodemus was a leader or a teacher in Israel, and he, being a learned man, did not understand what it meant to be born again, nor did he understand what Jesus meant when he told the teacher about the function of the Holy Spirit in believers' lives. If he was a teacher of the law of God to the Jews, and he did not understand the concept of being born again, do you suppose the members of the local synagogues would understand salvation any better than he? No. If the blind lead the blind, they're going to end up where? We call that ditch ministry. Don't follow somebody blind. Given the fact that some leaders in religious circles do not understand being born again by the Spirit of God, how is that going to affect people's experience when they sense the Lord in their lives dealing with them about being born again? If the leaders don't understand the concept of being born again and they do not understand the function of the Holy Spirit, that you cannot be saved without the Holy Spirit, then when God deals with people about being born again, how are they going to learn, y'all? We're in that place in America. It is true that there is a distinct difference between being born into this world as a person, a human being, and being born again and become a spirit being who is also a child of God. Big distinct difference. Is there not one is flesh and that is of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. You cannot mix oil and water. What communion does the unbeliever have with the believer? Since the natural person who thinks with the human brain cannot comprehend or understand God nor understand salvation apart from the Holy Spirit, we can see how people can get confused about eternal salvation. It's an easy subject to get confused about when you're not allowing the Holy Spirit to lead you in it. Confusion, how many know Satan is the author of confusion? Confusion can occur when people who are in leadership but do not understand salvation and they try to tell carnally minded people about God and salvation when they themselves do not rely upon the help and the direction of the Holy Spirit. They go to seminary. A lot of people go to seminary not saved. We know this from promise keepers back when they had conventions. They would ask pastors if they'd been born again. And there would be pastors come out on the field to the altar call to receive the Holy Spirit and be saved. And they've been ministering behind pulpits, y'all. 
If you don't have the Spirit of God in you, how can you be led by the Spirit of God? Christianity is not window shopping for saviors. You cannot be on the outside looking on the inside and think you're going to experience what God can only do when you get on the inside. Consequently, people have gotten frustrated at the whole process and have given bad reviews about Christianity. See, now you know where we're going. It is fair, is it fair, to give God and His plan of salvation bad reviews and, ba and bad ratings simply because there is a breakdown between the pulpit and the pews? No. It's not fair to give God a bad rap. It's not fair to give salvation a, a bad review and to criticize Christianity and being born again when you have not experienced it for yourselves. You cannot walk on the outside and not experience Him and think that you know Him. You've got to experience Him in order to know Him. And once you have experienced Him, I like it this way. A person with an experience or an encounter with God is never at the mercy with anyone with an argument. You can't argue with me because I've experienced him. I know in whom I have believed. I've gotten past that belief state where you can come and make me doubt God. The devil is a liar. I got in God's presence and I sought God until God revealed himself to me. And when he revealed himself to me, he filled me with his love. I remember at the War Harvest in LJ when God had called us to pastor this church. We were in a Sunday evening service and, and the Lord got a hold of me so severe. I remember on the front row in that, that double wide trailer. Yeah, we started out in trailers. But God promoted us. But I remember getting on that front seat and I was just bawling my eyes out because I was experiencing the love of God just feeling me. It was just absolutely running over inside of me. I cannot deny Him. He has shown Himself true to me. He has revealed Himself to me. He's shown up when the devil has shown up. God has showed out when the enemy showed up and says, I've got you now, my crosshairs, and I'm going to take you and your family down and destroy the ministry. And God said, I'm right here with you I got your back just be still and know that I am God and every time God takes what was meant for evil and turns it around for good how can I deny the Lord and Savior who has brought us through all that he has brought us through you can't tell me you've reached me too late to tell me God is not alive that God is dead the devil is a liar Jesus is not only alive. Jesus has defeated death. It's one thing to have life. It's another thing to come back from the dead. He's overcome it all. Now turn with me to John chapter 20. So we're talking about Jesus' resurrection and how he's overcome death. And in verse 24, we're going to pick it up. And this is where Jesus has been in the grave for three days. And then he comes back and he visits his disciples who are scared to death because of the Jews. They're wanting to kill the disciples, so they're hiding out in a room. Jesus appears to them twice within eight days. Let's pick it up in verse 24. Now Thomas was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. And the other disciples therefore said to him, Thomas, We have seen the Lord. So he said to them, unless I see in his hands the print of nails and I put my finger into the print of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And he's a disciple of Christ, y'all. Didn't Jesus say after three days I'm going to rise and come back to you? Go before me? And eight days, after eight days, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas was with them this time. And Jesus came, and the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace to you. You know, if we were standing here or we were sitting here, and Jesus walked through that wall right there, I don't think I'd have a problem that he's alive. I really don't. I think, you know, somebody walking through that wall, that's a pretty good indication. They're alive more than I am. Because nothing natural can stop Jesus. Oh. Woo! 
Nothing natural can stop Jesus from showing up. But good old Thomas, I got to see it for myself. And so, Jesus shows up and he says to Thomas, comes to Thomas. Now, he's already showed himself to the others. Now, he's going to talk to Thomas. Reach your finger here and look at my hands and reach your hand here and put it into my side. And look what he said. Not only did, did he walk through the wall, now he's talking to Thomas face to face, but he's told Thomas to literally put his fingers in the nail prints of Jesus' hand inside. And he says this, Do not be unbelieving, but believing. Just because you see Jesus walk through the wall does not mean you'll come to faith. That deep. I said just because, because your mind will tell you it's playing with you. That wasn't real. I dreamed that. You know, some of y'all been healed before. And the saint show up. You didn't get your healing. And before you know it, he talked you out of your healing. Satan will talk you out of stuff. That will come after you've had an experience with God. If you don't allow that experience to get faith inside of your heart that he is the risen Lord. But once you get faith in the risen Lord, that devil coming talking to you ain't going to talk you out of what you've experienced with Christ. Thomas is like many in the world today. Let me put it this way. Thomas is like a lot in the church world today. Not the church, the church world. There are those who have heard about the resurrection of Jesus. And they've heard about Jesus dying for their sins, for the sins of the world, so that people can be born again through him. But they refuse to believe the truth until they see proof. Besides having ministers who do not fully understand being born again and the operation or function of the Holy Spirit in believers' life, now we read how people can be reluctant to believe the truth until they see proof. Thomas said, I will not believe until I see. And he saw, and Jesus still told him, don't be unbelieving. No wonder there is a breakdown between sinners being drawn to faith in Jesus by the Father. No one comes to the Father except they're drawn by the Spirit. And them coming to faith because there is a lack of understanding of spiritual truths within them. Many people are drawn, but not all come to faith. They come out, but they don't go in. The Jews came out of bondage. They came out of slavery, which is the top and a shadow of us coming out of sin. But they didn't have the faith to go in. Because there's a breakdown in the wilderness. See, in the wilderness, between the coming out and the going in, you got to die to this, the flesh. But if you ever die to the flesh, and you can't die to the flesh on your own, Jesus has to increase inside of you, and that makes your flesh decrease. That is the transfer. Matter of fact, let me put it this way. When you come out of the Red Sea and you're a new creation in Christ, between the Red Sea and the Jordan River, there better be a transformation that goes on in the side of you that gets you looking just like Jesus so you can cross over that Jordan into your promised land and fulfill all that God has put you on earth to fulfill. Can I get a witness in this church? There has to be a transformation, y'all. So there is a breakdown there between the drawing to the Lord to faith and then coming to faith because here's the problem. There's a lack of spiritual understanding of the truths. And we see that in Nicodemus, who is a teacher of the law. He didn't have spiritual understanding. You mean I got to crawl back into my mama's womb? Be born again? No, dude. You got to be born of the Spirit. Thomas made the same mistake that many people make who are today in hell. They made that same mistake. They refused to place their faith in Jesus because he just didn't make sense. You ever come to church and, and nothing made sense? You have to ask God to give you understanding. Because it's spiritually discerned, not mentally comprehended. So they refuse to place their faith in Jesus because he just doesn't make sense to them. Or the truths that he has spoken uh, uh, to them 
didn't set well with them. So they chose to turn a deaf ear and harden their hearts, and they died in their sins like Jesus warned the Jews in John chapter 8 because they did not comprehend him when he said these spiritual truths to them, especially in John 6 where he was teaching them in Capernaum, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you'll have no part in me, and you'll have no life beyond this life. And they argued with him. They got mad with him, and they walked away. It's easy when you don't understand something to get aggravated, throw it down, and walk away from it. But some of us are hungry. We tasted everything else, and it didn't satisfy. And I hear this Jesus is going to satisfy me. So if I don't understand him, that's just an obstacle that I have to overcome. Jesus has already come death, hell, and overcome death, hell, and the grave. I at least need to overcome my lack of spiritual understanding so I can get to know my God better. Can I get a witness? When you know God spiritually, God. Daniel says those who know their God shall be what? The reason God has me preach the truth here every day that we come here as a body of Christ, the reason he has me preach the truth to you is because your faith got to be in this and not in man's opinion. Man has gotten up here and given you their opinion, given you what they think it should be, what they think it ought to be. The devil's a liar. The only thing that's going to make you stand when persecution comes is that you have had a revelation of this word. It's not words on a page. It is the living soul. Savior and Lord dwelling inside of you, and he's revealing himself to you. But some people say, I don't understand this, and they walk away. And Simon Peter says, where else can we go, Lord? Only you have the words of eternal life. Even Peter didn't get it, though he acted like he got it. He still didn't get it because he still walked away from Jesus whenever he was being judged. But he eventually came back. So then he got it. He thought he got it before, but he didn't really get it. Sometimes you think you get it. You ever thought that? Oh, I got it this time. And then later on you find out you really got it because you'll know you'll get it because you won't go back. Woo! Somebody write this down. I, I might preach this later. When you really get it, you won't go back. Hmm. There ain't no D-I-B-O-R-C-E in Christianity. You don't walk away from him. If you walk away from him, you didn't get it. Because when Simon Peter and, and about nine other the disciples were asked, are you going to love Christ more than yourself? They said, go ahead and hang us up. They died because they knew they had had a living encounter with the risen Savior and Lord, and it got in their knower. It gets in your knower. You can't deny it. I don't care what it costs you. You cannot deny it. And so God realizes that things are getting dark down here. Things are getting hard. So he's stepping up the heat on us and getting us ready for what the enemy is going to try to throw against us or throw us into. God is getting us ready, but those that are window shopping, they're not getting it. They be virgins, they not getting prepared. They have no oil for their lamps. But if you know the Spirit and you know what's going on, you know what day it is and you know how much time has gone by, you know you've got to use what little bit of time you got left to prepare for what is about to happen. Are you prepared for what's about to happen, y'all? Ain't about digging a, hunk, a bunker and getting in it and hunker down. It's about being strong in the Lord and walking in the power of his might in the evil day, Paul said. Now, even though, let's get back to Thomas. Even though Thomas didn't want to believe that Jesus was alive after the disciples told him, they told him, nah, I'm not going to do it. I got to see it for myself. Jesus continued to deal with Thomas's heart until Thomas came to faith in Jesus. When he came to faith in Jesus, he knew he was the risen Lord because he says, my Lord and my God. Oh, now you believe. Thomas, what did Thomas have to do to get to that place of knowing? Y'all ready for it? He had to humble his heart. 
A lot of people don't understand things. They won't humble them heart, their hearts so God can give them understanding. You remember in Ephesians, where, Ephesians 1 where Paul's talking about the new converts there in Ephesus. And he says, I'm praying for you that the Lord will give you the spirit of understanding and revelation. That the eyes of your understanding may be enlightened. That you may know the hope of your calling. That's what's got to happen. When we don't understand something, don't walk away frustrated. Seek the Lord about it. Don't let it go. And God will see your hunger and he will answer you. He says, call unto me and I will what? He'll do what those people with your uh, car insurance, I mean your car, uh, what was that? Warranty, thank you. Won't do for you. So Thomas had to humble his heart and believe before he could know that Jesus was alive, even though he saw him with his eyes. Wow. That's powerful, y'all. You can literally see the risen Lord with your eyes, and it still not bring you to faith. So how can we get up here as preachers and tell you to understand salvation? You can't do it with this. You got to give it the heart. It's not about seeing Jesus that will make you follow him. It's about placing faith in him and allowing the Holy Spirit to reveal him to you that he is the risen Lord. And then God will give you spiritual understanding to know him for certain that he is Lord. Now Matthew 13. Sometimes you got to take a big steak and you got to cut it up in little bitty pieces. That's what we just did. Verse 10, Matthew 13. Y'all okay? And the disciples came and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? Jesus has been talking to the Jews there, and he's been talking to them in parables. And he answered and said to them, Because it is given to you, he's talking to the disciples now, he's given to you to what? To know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. Wait a minute. Aren't they God's chosen people? Aren't they his elect? Did, he not, did God not send Jesus into Israel to seek and to save that which was lost? The re relationship, the, the connection between God and Israel? Yes. And he says, but it has not been given to them to know the mysteries of the kingdom. Huh? For whoever has, to him more will be given. And he will have abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Now, that don't sound fair, does it? Whoever wrote the Bible didn't believe in socialism. <laughs> and everybody said, yeah. America, get a clue. Therefore, I speak to them how? In parables, because seeing they do not see, hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. There it is, y'all. I can talk to you all day long about Jesus, and you won't get it. Because you're hearing, but you're not hearing. You're seeing, but you're not really seeing. And you're, you're, you're receiving, but you're not understanding. And in them, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, Hearing you will hear and shall not understand. And seeing you will see and not perceive, being able to recognize the truth. For the hearts of this people, now we're getting to why they will hear but not receive. For the hearts of this people have grown what? Dull, their ears are hard of hearing. And their eyes have closed. Lest they should see with their eyes, hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their what? Understand with your heart. Not know with your mind, understand with your heart, and turn that I should what? Heal them. See, if you won't take the time to understand God's word when it's being declared or when you read it, then you're not going to receive the blessings that are in that word. Amen? Without faith, no one can... Please God. Jesus told the disciples the reason why he spoke to the multitudes in parables such as the parable of the sower. But he spoke in a way that the disciples could understand him privately. Now, I want you to think about what Jesus just said. Jesus has spent, at this point, a great deal of time teaching multitudes of the Jews the principles of the kingdom of heaven. Has he not? And he did it. In sermons and parables, he taught them the principles of the kingdom of God and taught them about God and taught them about himself. And he did all of that teaching, y'all, to the Jews who were unable to understand 
or even able to receive what he had to say to them. Talk about an effort in futility. Wow. So ask this question. Why share the truth with those who won't receive the truth when they hear it and you know they won't receive the truth? Right? On judgment day, they won't have an excuse to offer to God at the white throne judgment when he asked them why they rejected salvation through his son Jesus. They were given the opportunity, weren't they, to place their faith in Jesus as they heard him teach and preach. But they hardened their hearts because their ears were dull and their eyes were closed. And they rejected him because they did not understand him. However, for those who heard the parables and sought to know him better, God gave them understanding to receive spiritual truths into the hearts that the truth may bring them to, into a place of their faith in Jesus as God's Son, as their Savior. See, when you don't understand, but you ask for understanding, God will give you spiritual understanding. Then you can start receiving that. And then you can know spiritually, not mentally. A lot of people know things mentally, but they're not saved here spiritually. Let's take it a little deeper. Y'all ready? First, cha uh, First Samuel chapter 3. Is this helping you? Yeah. I got three. <laughs> First Samuel three, verse one. Hannah has asked God to give her a son. She said, "If you give me a son, I'll give him back to you." So he, she has taken the boy Samuel into the priest to serve the Lord in the temple, and it says, "Now the boy ministered. This boy Samuel." ministered the Lord before Eli, and the word of the Lord was rare in those days, kind of like in America today. The word of the Lord is rare, and there was no widespread revelation. And it came to pass at that time, while Eli was lying down, now he's the priest in the temple of God, appointed by God, anointed by God, was lying down in his place, in his place. He wasn't standing in his place, he was lying down in his place, laying down on the job. And his eyes had begun to grow dim. What did Jesus just say about the Jews? Your eyes are dim. Your ears can't hear. That he could not see. And before the lamp of God went out in the tabernacle of the Lord where the ark of God was. And while Samuel was lying down. That the Lord said to Samuel. And called Samuel. And he answered. Here I am. And he ran to who? Eli. God's calling Samuel. But Samuel is running to man. See, we cannot run to man when God's calling us. But inevitably, what do we do? We do like Samuel. We run to man. What does it mean when I hear this voice? Oh, you're hearing voices. Because they're not spiritually discerning. They will tell you the wrong thing. You need to go say, see a psychiatrist, not me. You're hearing voices. So he ran to Eli and said... Here I am, for you called me. And he said, I did not call, lie down again. And he went and lay down. And then the Lord called yet again Samuel. So Samuel arose and he went where? If you do the same thing the same way and you expect different results, what is that called? So Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. And he answered, I did not call my son. Go lay down. Now Samuel did not yet. Now we're getting to it. This is why he went to Samuel and not God. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, nor was the word of the Lord revealed to him. And the Lord called to Samuel again the third time. So he arose and he did what? Went back to Eli and said, Here I am, for you did call me. And then Eli, then Eli what? He was slow, but he got a clue. He perceived. He didn't hear it. But he perceived it. You don't have to hear it for yourself. If somebody tells you something they heard from God and it is in fact from God, you can perceive it as being of God. And they perceived that the Lord, he perceived that the Lord had called the boy we got breakthrough in the temple. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, go lie down, and it shall be if he, God, calls you that you must say, speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down in his place, and the Lord spoke to him, and Samuel got it. It takes a while to get it, don't it? 
I get that Samuel didn't recognize the voice of the Lord because he didn't know the Lord and the word of the Lord was not revealed to him. I get that. What's dis disconcerting to me is the fact that it took the Lord calling Samuel three times before God's priest. Eli realized that it was the Lord speaking to the boy. That's slow of hearing. It reminds me of Nicodemus being a teacher in Judaism, but he didn't know God, nor did he comprehend the concept of being born again by the Spirit of God. Now you've got two leaders in key places not getting it. Even though Samuel didn't know the Lord or his word, Samuel's heart was open to the Lord because he obeyed Eli's instructions after three times to acknowledge the Lord and invite him to impart spiritual wisdom into him, and he did that. Now turn with me to Psalm 34. We're getting down where the rubber hits the road. Anywhere that happens, there's friction. <laughs> Psalm 34, 2. David writes, he says, My soul shall make its boast in who? In the Lord. The who? The humble shall what? Hear it. Oh, now scripture is backing up what I'm teaching. The humble shall what? And be what? Oh, I can't wait for this service to be over. You're not humble. My stomach is hunger. Well, God's feeding you. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he what? He heard me, and he didn't just hear me. He delivered me from all my fears. They look to him. See, whenever you humble yourself, and he gives you understanding, and you hear him, and you're glad, then you'll look to him, and he will make you radiant. They looked to him and were radiant, and their faces were not ashamed. That's where God's taken us, church. We're not ashamed of our past because our past is over. This man cried out. It wasn't a particular man. It was just any man. This man cried out, and the Lord what? Because he was humble and saved him out of all his troubles. So now he's delivered us out of all our fears. Now he's delivering us out of all our troubles. And it also says that the Lord in Psalm 103 will deliver us out of all our afflictions. And the angel of the Lord encamps all around all who what? So if you fear him, the, angels of the, the angel of the Lord is encamping about you to deliver you. And then he gets down to verse 8. This is where we're going to land. Oh, taste and what? If you don't taste, you ain't going to see. When Eve looked at that forbidden fruit on the tree of knowledge, she says, it is a true uh, tree desirable to make one wise. And when she ate of its fruit, it says her eyes were and she knew. She knew. She knew because she tasted of the fruit. She was just tasting a fruit, y'all. It was just a fruit. It was the spiritual connotation connected to the fruit that made her see something. You shall not eat it, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely what? Die. Spiritual connotation. If you eat the forbidden fruit, you're just eating a piece of fruit. But because God said don't eat it, now it's spiritual. To the good that you know to do, but do not do it to them, it is sin. So she eats of the forbidden fruit, takes it in, it's just a fruit. But because their spiritual connotation, God has said, doubt. She partook of it, and the eyes of her understanding woke up. And for the first time, she realized she was naked. She knew. Now, wait a minute. If that can happen in the natural, and we get lost, can it not happen also in the spirit, and we get saved, where we taste of the Lord's goodness, and then we will what? See God's goodness, and then we will know God's goodness. So that's where God's taking us. you got to get past, I'm learning about Jesus. No, I'm eating off of Jesus because he is the bread of life. And if I taste him, 
I'm not getting it up in here. I'm so hungry for him. I want to consume him in my heart. My heart is hungry for the truths of God. And when that truth gets inside my heart, my heart opens up. And now I come alive because the bread of life has come inside of me. And I cannot deny what I have experienced from God. So you got a lot of people on church pews hearing and not receiving. Seeing, but not able to grasp it. Hearts, but they're dull and they cannot perceive. Taste, then you'll see, then you'll know, then you'll experience for yourself. For those in the nations of the world who have hunger, a spiritual hunger in the hearts for the Lord and His truth, God will make Himself known to you. He will. If you come to the Lord broken over your sin and you call upon His name, the Lord will look past your sin and He'll hear your cry. And the Lord will not reject your cry because you were humble and broken over your sin. People who are, who are hungry for the things of God and are humble before His presence, they will receive spiritual understanding from the Holy Spirit and will come to know the Lord and the Bible as the truth from God. However, for those who refuse to humble themselves or to seek God's face, they will be like the young man who had great possessions, great wealth, and he asked the Lord, what good thing must I do, good teacher, that I may have eternal life? And Jesus told him, go and sell all that you have. Give the proceeds to the poor. Come and follow me and you'll have eternal life. Jesus told him exactly what to do to get what he wanted. And he wanted it or he wouldn't ask. But he found out what it was going to cost him. Wait a minute. That sounded like Jesus telling him he got to earn it. What if I get up here and say, how many want to be saved? And we had, I don't know, 20 hands. I say, go, wait, before, before we go any further, go sell everything you got. Give the proceeds to the poor. Come back and talk to me, and I'll lead you in a conversion prayer. How many of you do think we get saved in this church? So is that works? You got to sell what you have. Give the money away. Make yourself broke. Then come follow me. That sounds like works. But it's Jesus. So what is it? His trust was in his riches. God. Jesus proves to us that his trust was in his riches because when he heard this, he was sorrowful in his heart and he walked away. You cannot trust the Lord and trust in your riches and come to the saving faith in Jesus Christ. So Jesus called him on his demon. I want you to take that God of wealth and I want you to lay it on the altar if you want me because that is going to be your stumbling block to get to me. So if you go ahead and lay it down now on the altar, you will be able to walk straight to me and I will reveal myself to you. And as he was walking away, his disciples said to the Lord, says, have we not left mother, father, sister, brother, houses and land to follow you? And Jesus said, yes, you have. And everybody that leaves these things and follows me, I'll give it back to them a hundredfold in this life and eternal life in the one to come but the man who was rich and walked away because he didn't want to lose his stuff did not hear that revelation because he hardened his heart a minute too soon that, that, that's powerful right there if he just stuck it out he would have heard Simon's question Jesus' answer that would have answered his dilemma as to how am I going to get by on nothing but faith because God's going to give it back to you, brother. You will own Twitter. Thought I'd slip that in on you. But for those who refuse to humble themselves to seek his face, you got to humble yourself to come here, y'all. Amen or oh me. But if you refuse to humble yourself, you're going to be like that young man. 
you'll walk away from it and miss heaven by that much. People can blame and criticize God. They can criticize Jesus. They can and do criticize Christians and Christianity, our faith, all they want because they do not get what we get who believe in Jesus. They get on the even news. Tell them about how bad Christianity is and how awful Christians are and how much the world would be a better place if it wasn't for Christians. Presidents can go to a prayer breakfast and tell pastors to get off their high horses. And he's done that because they do not understand Christian faith. Yet if they would humble themselves and seek the Lord with their whole heart, he will reveal himself to them that they might be saved. Otherwise, they too will die in their sins and be forever separated from God and live in torment. I don't want that for anyone. I don't care how awful they are to Christians. In conclusion, Matthew 5, 6, Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, Blessed are they which do hunger, which do what? Hunger and thirst for righteousness. They shall be what? Filled. It, it blows me away, the stuff God brings out of me while I'm preaching. I'm just, I'm blown away more than y'all are. I hope y'all blown away because it's God's Word. It's His living, breathing Word, is it not? Because God is, is feeding y'all. Matter of fact, based on your hunger will determine how well sermons go. So if you don't want an agonizing, laborious sermon that grates your last nerve, come in here hungry. And your hunger will pull on the anointing of God, and God will feed you, and He will have me say things that will minister directly to you because you need those words confirmed to you so that you know you're hearing from God and not from man. Somebody needs to give God praise. In the house of God is where the bread of life should be. There should be so much bread of life, we have to take up baskets and feed the poor with them because the bread of life is feeding us so vastly. But be careful. Faith without works is what? And when you don't work and you receive the, the fatness of God's word. See, they put yokes around animals' necks. But it says in Isaiah 10, the anointing removes the burden and destroys the yoke. The anointing makes one fat. The anointing swells your neck so much it breaks the yoke of the enemy off of you. The problem is after the anointing is broken, be very careful that you don't get fat because then you become spiritually lazy and we've gotten spiritually lazy in America because God has made us fat. So what do we got to do? Humble ourselves, seek God's face, turn from our wicked ways and pray. God bless y'all. Please stand.